My name is David Chard, and I uh, have the honor of being the dean here at the Simmons School at SMU, and um, the double honor of welcoming you this afternoon and to kind of kick off this um, presentation. We're very pleased that you're here um, to talk about what's a timely um, on, on sequestration day. Um, top of mind is what ha what's happening to budgets, and um, but this particular conversation is about, uh, was really an intersection between two events that were planned. One was a summit on college affordability, which I was trying to um, marshal along, and a discussion amongst our higher education faculty about the college loan crisis. And the two seemed to fit really well together. And obviously, we've drawn a number of uh, important people who uh, want to be part of this conversation. So we're really pleased um, that the two could come together and discuss, discuss what I think is um, not only important for us to understand what went wrong, but also what to do about making it right. What are the solutions? So we hope that the combination will uh, be a compelling conversation today. Um, there's intense interest about this. In the room today are university and college leadership, school district leaders, policymakers, counselors, nonprofit leaders, financial aid directors, financial institution representatives, um, and community members. And we all look forward to you all helping inform this conversation from your perspectives. This year, we were very fortunate at the Simmons School to bring two nationally recognized faculty members to our program in higher education. And they're going to lead off the discussion today um, with a brief talk on the student loan crisis, just to get us sort of thinking about um, where we've been, where we're going, and how to solve some of these problems. Following their talk, we'll have a panel discussion with a broader group of solution-oriented folks. Um, but let me begin by introducing two gentlemen we lovingly refer to as the Michaels. Um, first, Michael Harris, if you just want to raise your hand, Michael. Michael Harris joined us this year. He was uh, previously at the University of Alabama. Um, his scholarly interests are in public policy and the organization of public higher education. He's currently exploring the issue of institutional diversity and the interplay between market forces, government involvement, and higher education. Uh, the other Michael, Michael McClendon, is a professor of higher education policy and leadership and uh, uh, is the associate dean here in our school. Um, prior to his appointment at SMU, Michael McClendon served for 13 years as a professor of public policy in higher education at Vanderbilt University, where he also held roles as executive associate dean of Peabody College and as director of several graduate and undergraduate programs. His scholarship and teaching focus on governance, finance, and public policy of higher education. Anyway, uh, we look forward to you getting this uh, launched. And I think, Michael Harris, you're going to start. Thank you, Dean Chard. You know, one of the things I think I can speak for, for both Michael and I is it's uh, gratifying to be in a higher education program with school leadership and the dean's office really appreciates the role of higher education within the broad study of education. And I think that's something we both uh, very much appreciated uh, in the short time that we've both been here at Simmons. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to see such a strong turnout today to talk about what is one of the key issues facing higher education in our country today. We here at Simmons are really proud of our growing higher education program, and we're encouraging our students to face the challenges of our higher education system by using their leadership potential and improving colleges and universities across the country. There are very few issues today, I think many of us would agree, uh, in higher education, if not all of education, uh, that are more pressing than the question of student debt, and really ensuring that college education remains accessible and affordable for our nation's students. Since our country's founding, higher education has played an essential role in achieving American aspiration and the commitment that we've made to one another to preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. President Washington, in his farewell address to the nation, famously warns our country of the dangers of foreign entanglement, and of the dangers of partisanship. And certainly today, we've learned the dangers of partisanship. But I think what's more central to our American character, however, is his advice regarding education. He said, promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. In proportion as the structure of government gives force to public opinion, it is essential, essential, 
that public opinion should be enlightened. President Obama, in his recent State of the Union, echoed these trends. To grow our middle class, he said, our citizens must have access to education and training that today's jobs require. But we also have to make sure that America remains a place where everyone who's willing to work hard has a chance to get ahead. Vitally, higher education plays a role in achieving the American dream. And if we look to the history of higher education, we see some dramatic gains in this area. Since the conclusion of hostilities in World War II, until today, we see significant growth in the enrollments in higher education. Starting in the middle of this graphic, higher education enrollment grows from 2 million students in 1942 to approaching 20 million at the conclusion of the 2010 decade. This growth is accompanied by significant economic benefits. Additionally, let's not forget the benefits that are non-economic. Benefits of higher education accrue not solely to the individual, but to all of us in society. We know that college graduates participate in philanthropy at greater rates. We know that college graduates vote in greater numbers. We know that health outcomes and any number of critical measures to ensuring life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness flow from the benefits of higher education. Just as notable, are the labor market outcomes. There's a clear indication in looking at unemployment data, and these are the figures from last month from the U.S. Department of Labor. High school graduates, high school dropouts, simply do not fare as well as graduates of community colleges and four-year colleges and universities. As damaging as this recession has been for recent graduates unable to find well-paying jobs, and there are certainly numerous media accounts describing these cases. The macro labor outcomes are far better than the alternative. Simply put, less educated Americans struggle to find employment far more than those with experience in higher education. Yet we also know the cost of higher education has grown dramatically. Really, the numbers on this chart are not as significant as those trend lines, which are upward. The dotted line in the middle there represents private, nonprofit higher education institutions which slow a constant, steady upward trend. Particularly dramatic, the orange line is the public for-profit sector, or excuse me, the public four-year sector, and the public two-year sector. Dramatic escalations in cost in recent years. These precipitous climbs, public higher education is simply more expensive than it used to be. Today, a four-year college education costs $8,655 per year, an increase of 27% in just five years. For private universities, the cost now exceeds $29,000, up 13% since 2007. And these trends are certainly not the sole challenge of four-year institutions. Public community colleges saw a 24% increase over this same period and currently have a price tag of $3,131, according to the College Board. These significant increases are certainly not happening in a vacuum. The rise of tuition and fees is occurring while the economy desperately needs educated workers to achieve the economic outcomes necessary within a knowledge economy. With the escalating cost of college comes a growing need to figure out how to pay for this vital, necessary higher education. Furthermore, we tell students higher education is not simply part of their educational journey, but holds their future ability to succeed economically, socially, and otherwise. Today, U.S. households owe $700 billion in automobile loans. Credit card debt exceeds $800 billion. Student loan debt now exceeds $1 trillion. It's a sobering number, a trillion dollars of debt on higher education. Leading economists suggest that one of the greatest weaknesses in our economy at present, that slowing the economic recovery out of the Great Recession, is the debt load of households, and in particular, the debt load of students and graduates. Now, some of this proportional growth can be attributed to the general deleveraging that households are undertaking as part of the recovery out of the recession. This red line you see there, coming out of 2008, there has been a slow deleveraging of other types of household debt. 
including mortgage debt. However, student debt continues to increase dramatically. Now, certainly student loans have generally friendlier interest rates and terms than credit cards, for example, which may mean students and families are paying those off later. However, much of this increase occurs as a result of higher debt loads of students and a greater percentage of students taking out loans. Each year, $100 billion of federal loans are originated, another $10 billion in private student loans. This is a significant increase annually that we're seeing. The class of 2011, which is the, the best, most recent data that we have available, shows that the graduate graduated higher education with $26,600 in education debt, an increase of 5% over the class of 2010. And this has been a pretty standard increase year over year in recent years as each successive class continues to grow uh, a greater amount of debt. For the first time in 2004, loans exceeded grants as a percentage of aid to undergraduate students. And while grants have increased as a percentage in the last couple of years, this increase is largely attributable to the decline of family wealth and family income as a result of the recession, as opposed to a general policy move to reemphasize grants over loans. At a time in their lives when students should be saving to bring their first child home from the hospital, at a time when students should be celebrating their first real job, at a time when students should be beginning to save for retirement and establish their financial foundation, they're instead facing student debt unprecedented in the history of this country. Never before have we asked a generation to assume the cost of their college education the way we've asked this one. And the results are devastating for students, young and old. Loan default rates have increased, particularly predatory practices in for-profit colleges, although certainly not the exclusive purview of that sector, have devastated the financial foundation of thousands of students. But how do we get here? How do we move from a higher education system predicated on advancing these critical American values to one that leads to a diploma and debt? To be sure, no single cause, no simple policy change has led to this situation. I'd like to now turn to my colleague, Michael McClendon, uh, to really explore some of the potential causes of this sea change and how we pay for college and how we start to think about ways forward to ensure the success of our students, our colleges, and our nation. Michael. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today, and I just want to add my appreciation and my welcome to those that have come before uh, mine. Uh, this question of, of loan indebtedness, college student loan uh, debt in um, U.S. higher education is so important because it's not just relevant to higher education, the industry of higher education, institutions of higher education, it's really critical to the future of America, of the United States. Um, directly relating to this problem is a question of how socially mobile Americans will remain in the future, to what extent, I think you can hear me now, <laughs> what, will America's social, what will America's social mobility look like well into the future? Uh, how will we create educational opportunity for Americans that are of low-income backgrounds or from uh, groups that have been historically disadvantaged in U.S. higher education? And how will the United States continue to maintain a globally competitive and robust economy? All of these depend upon our ability to solve this problem before us. I have the best role here today of, of those uh, that we have um, in that I get to cast aspersions. My role is to try to identify some of the factors that have led to uh, identify some of the problems that have contributed to this crisis today. And let me begin first as the first of our six explanations for the student loan crisis. Explanation one. We often hear this, the states created the student loan crisis. The retreat, it goes something like this. The retreat of the American states as the primary financial stakeholders in American higher education has pushed costs directly onto consumers, onto students and their families. And this, in turn, has placed upward pressures on tuition levels, which obviously has created increasing loan indebtedness. And what do we mean about uh, states uh, surrendering their financial stakeholdership in U.S. higher education? It takes a number of forms, and we can display, I think, graphically in a variety of ways what this entails. Here is one element of the problem. 
this is uh, state fiscal support for the operating expenses of higher education per $1,000 of personal wealth, per $1,000 of personal income, rather. And you can see that in 1961, with the expansion of uh, our public systems of higher education and a concomitant increase in the financial role of the 50 American states in funding and providing opportunity for post-secondary access and participation in the U.S., we saw that state support for higher education began to rise relative to income available. This is not only the capacity of states to fund higher education, but their willingness to fund higher education, to subsidize it, to underwrite it both in the direct operation of institutions as well as in the indirect subsidy through state uh, financial support, financial loans and grants that go to students attending post-secondary education. This trend peaked in the late 1970s where about almost $11 out of every $1,000 of personal income in the American states was spent on higher education. And you can see this precipitous decline over time so that in 2011, almost half of that about, uh, what is that, $6 out of every $1,000 of personal income was being spent by the states on higher education. We can see here also the percent change in state appropriations relative to income over about a 10-year period. So this displays, if you'll see, uh, states broken down into three color shadings. Uh, this displays what states are funding on higher education relative or adjusting for income within the states. We have three different categories. You'll see that 17 states are in this lightest shading in which the percentage of decline has been between 0 and 30 percent. 17 other states have seen a decline in funding relative to wealth available to fund higher education between 30 and 45 percent. And 40, uh, 16 states, rather, have seen declines in state funding relative to income of 46 percent or more. You'll note, of course, that there's not a single state on here which has actually increased state funding for higher education relative to wealth. They're all precipitous declines. <coughs> state funding for higher education per FTE student has also declined over the past 20 years, especially since the economic downturn in 2001. So we're suggesting here, I want to suggest to you, there are two ways to think about uh, the capacity and the willingness of the states to fund higher education. The first one was that of relative to wealth available. The second here is relative to the number of students that are enrolling in our post-secondary institutions. In 2001, state funding stood at approximately $8,100 per full-time equivalent student enrolled in an institution of higher education. Since then, state funding, and this is for all states, per FTE student has declined as, stu as student enrollments have grown. As, uh, uh, Professor Harris indicated we've seen an enormous increase in college enrollments, but not the capacity or the willingness of the states to keep up in terms of their financial commitment to higher education. By 2005, educational appropriations per FTE student had shrunk to $6,600. By 2011, this had shrunk even farther to 6290 It's the lowest level of public support per full-time equivalent student in the last quarter century. <laughs> explanation or story number one. The states and their failure to keep up with funding higher education have brought about or contributed significantly to the college student loan crisis. But there's another explanation that's popular today. It points away from the states and it says, yes, but, but think also the fact that the states today fund uh, in real terms, in real dollars, uh, spend almost as much today as they ever have in the past. Rather, what's happening is that enrollments have been surging on college campuses, university budgets have been growing, and so the finger should point, at least in part, at colleges and universities themselves. Those unaccountable colleges and universities created the crisis. We have, for example, the tuition spiral that Michael mentioned just a few moments ago with sharp increases in college prices at public and private at two-year and four-year over the past 25-year period. There's also an argument that what we've seen underway over the past quarter century is a failure of leadership, both a failure in terms of mission creep by institutions, as well as the lack of bold strategic action to contain costs. Let me begin with the first mission creep. Uh, Clark Kerr, the eminent uh, former president of the University of California, uh, once termed the multiversity. The university had gone from being what it was in earlier times to now being a complex modern multiversity, uh, so varied and so rich in its different obligations that its mission was no longer singular 
but in fact it had become pluralistic. So diversified, it was hard to tell in some universities what their central mission was. Many would argue that today we've moved beyond not only the university or the multiversity, but that in many institutions, it's hard to say precisely what the core purpose of that institution is. It does so many different things. Uh, the criticism here is that there has not been fidelity to mission, to the core functions of an institution over time, and that too many institutions do too many different things, and that those too many different things at those institutions have led to an increase in college costs. That now being passed along to students and to families. There's a second criticism, which is that of a lack of bold strategic action to contain costs. Many had pointed to the economic downturn in 2008 and 2009 as a time in which it would have been ripe for many institutions to take bold leadership to say we're going to identify what our strategic purposes are, we're going to align our investments in support of those strategic purposes and efforts, and we're going to do the things in which we can be distinctive and have high quality and stop doing other things. Instead, too many institutions imposed, particularly in public higher education, imposed across the board budget cuts which weaken the quality of institutions rather than enhance it. So many have argued that in fact part of the problem in the escalation of college costs and thus contributing to the college loan problem is the failure of institutions to do their part. There's another criticism sometimes heard which is that there has been an amenities arms race in higher education and this is often alleged to be in existence primarily in the private college sector, that rather than targeted investments in the academic core of the institution, targeted investments around things that will help us improve what students know and are able to do and to be able to assess that in meaningful ways, that investments have been made in auxiliary enterprises or in amenities for students that are tangential to the core academic purpose of the institution. There's a third explanation for growing college uh, costs and for the college uh, loan crisis. The cost of maintaining high quality higher education itself created the crisis. Universities would say in response to story number two, yes, but the cost of doing business in higher education simply are naturally higher than those, the cost of doing business in most other sectors of the American economy. And what they mean by that is this that higher education institutions, not unlike healthcare sector, higher education institutions are particularly intensive in three dimensions. First, they're labor intensive enterprises. Not only do these institutions uh, need highly skilled individuals, but it's those highly skilled individuals along with health benefit packages that have been contributing to uh, increases in college cost over the past quarter century. Unlike most other organizations in society, colleges and universities, particularly high quality ones, thrive upon the ability to recruit a high wage human capital. And this has contributed to uh, cost in, in this industry. Second, these universities are capital intensive enterprises. These are ones in which a lot of effort has to be made to attend to the capital infrastructure. One important aspect of which is the technology infrastructure of campuses. And technology, as we know, just like healthcare costs, have been driving up the cost of doing business in organizations, particularly in higher education, where technology is used not as a substitute for human labor, but as a complement to it. When we bring technology in to universities like these, often we're not replacing the instructor or the teacher or the mentor. We're allowing that individual to do more with technological tools, particularly in the learning process that costs money and it costs a great deal of money to support that infrastructure. And finally, universities are energy intensive enterprises. All three of these means that the natural rate of growth for inflation in higher education is higher than that of the natural rate of the, of the rate of inflation in many other sectors. And that is why students have been incurring uh, many more of the costs associated with uh, colleges doing their business. Explanation number four, the predatory lending practices of for-profit colleges created the crisis. As Michael mentioned just a few moments ago, there is a serious problem uh, with respect to the for-profit industry itself. Although only 12% of all enrollments in U.S. higher education are found in the for-profit sector, Students at those institutions account for more than 46% of all student loan dollars in default. And, and why is this the case? Well, in part, you may not know, average tuition levels at for-profit colleges is more than $31,000 a year on average. 
and many of the students who are attending for-profit institutions do not necessarily have the financial wherewithal, the information, uh, financial literacy, or the information to be able to assess the quality of the institution that they're choosing to attend. Um, there's also a problem with uh, some of the predatory um, enrollment practices of for-profit institutions. For example, 3.7 billion in estimated marketing and commercials uh, from the Apollo Group's University of Phoenix, about $377 million alone. 3.7 billion is about what this uh, sector, the for-profit for sector, spends annually in uh, aggressive advertisement. We've seen this on TV, all of us, I suspect, particularly around sporting events. Um, and what we've seen recently is um, an increasing number and frequency of reports indicating that for all that money spent in bringing in students that may not be financially or academically prepared for college, we have as a result of that low graduation rates and low job placement for students who attend these institutions, thus incurring high levels of debt when they lead, leave and the inability to make it up in terms of labor market returns once they're in the workforce. Explanation five, the financial mismanagement of Americans and the lack of information about the need to prepare financially for college has created the crisis. I think this takes two primary forms. First, low savings rates left Americans more and more dependent on loans as a primary means of paying for college. And because of those low savings rates, Americans in particular were very poorly prepared for the economic downturn of 2008 and 2009. And so many families, in order to keep children who were already in college, in college during the depths of that economic crisis began to take out more and more personal indebtedness in order to help their children stay in college. There's a second variation of this, which is the lack of, and I emphasize this, the lack of accurate, reliable information about college prices, particularly information among low-income Americans diminishes the likelihood of those individuals beginning to save well in advance for college. We've moved from a system over the past 30 years of significant public subsidy of higher education to increasingly one of individuals needing to save on their own for college. Um, and particularly for low-income Americans, the message that they hear, research tells us, is that college costs too much. And in fact, we have empirical research that shows that poor Americans and Americans of color tend to overestimate the cost of college attendance, particularly when we take into account the sticker price of colleges. That is, what colleges discount in the form of uh, loans and grants for an individual to be able to attend. And what this does is it sends an inaccurate signal to students too early that they can't afford higher education, and therefore they tune out. Their families don't prepare for it academically or financially. Finally, explanation six, it only looks like a crisis. Many today would argue, well, notwithstanding the criticisms um, alleged in explanations one through five, it's still the fact that demand for higher education remains at near historic high levels. Higher education is vital to our success and to our economic success individually and collectively. Americans know this and they continue to attend regardless of the prices. There's a second argument, which is the college wage premium is very high. There's been a recent debate over um, what that wage premium is. Is it in fact a million dollars, as we long assumed it was, or is it closer to $500,000? That is to say, these are the returns upon completion of an undergraduate degree, a BA degree. Is it 500,000 or 1 million? The fact is that non-completion means it's nowhere near either of those two estimates. Completing an undergraduate degree will produce for someone a return in the labor market of between a half a million and a million dollars over the course of one's lifetime. And that's just at the undergraduate level. So many would argue that because of that return on investment, whatever the price is that people must pay in order to attend higher education is worth it in the long run. I think this is fallacious in large part because what we see are really significant um, differences in college going and the ability of Americans to pay for college depending upon income levels and uh, race and ethnicity. Um, even though it's the case that on balance Americans, uh, graduates of college, make between $500,000 and a million dollars more if they complete a college education. The fact is that there is enormous stratification among Americans um, on this dimension. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's not the case that, in fact, this stands in and of itself. 
the reality, all parties bear some responsibility for the problems that we have before us today. Yes, the states have retreated um, as historic subsidizers of American higher education the way they did in the past. Yes, it's the case that Americans are not preparing themselves financially or academically well in advance, years in advance, to be able to afford a college education. Yes, it's the case that colleges uh, need to do more to contain costs and that leaders must do more to make strategic decisions about where precious resources will be invested. Yes, all of these things are accurate, but the fact is all parties bear some responsibility. How do we fix the problem? I think this is the most difficult problem we face today, and I'm sure glad that I don't have to answer it. Instead, <laughs> if I may, call to the front our four distinguished panelists of today who will help us answer this question, how do we solve the college loan crisis in the United States. I'm pleased to introduce to you our panelists today. I'd like to begin, uh, if I may, second from your right. Uh, Dan Weaver is joining us today. Dan, would you uh, raise your hand, please? Well, you have a, you have a, a placard there in front of you as well. Uh, Commissioner of Higher Education for the state of Texas, uh, Raymond Paredes, was unable to join us, uh, an emergency at the last moment. Um, but we're very, very pleased that Dan is with us. Dan is the Assistant Commissioner for Business and Support Services with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Dan has held this position since uh, June of 2006 and has also served a variety of roles uh, since joining the agency. He currently serves as Assistant Commissioner for Business where, and Support Services uh, over which he oversees uh, all state financial aid programs. Prior to joining the Coordinating Board, Dan worked in the private sector for more than 20 years. He has a bachelor's of science degree in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's of business administration from the Macomb School of Business also at UT Austin. Uh, we learned in advance that almost every one of us here today has some connection to the state of Michigan. Uh, Dan enjoys that as well, having some spent some time there in that state. Second, Sue McMillan. Sue, would you, I think it's I'm obvious where Sue is. <laughs> She's well identified. Sue McMillan is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Texas Guaranteed Student Loan Corporation. Uh, Sue became the President and Chief Executive Officer on October the 1st, 2004. Um, she has, prior to her joining, uh, uh, prior to her uh, promotion as President and CEO, Sue had 23 years of experience in banking and in student loans. Uh, under Sue's leadership, the organization experienced a significant decline in the cohort student loan default rate and a steady increase in cure rates, default recoveries, and loan guarantees. Soon, uh, Sue is active nationally uh, with a variety of organizations and associations, including the National Council of Higher Education Loan Programs, the Council for Management of Education Finance, and the Association for Texas Lenders for Education. Originally from Michigan, Sue moved to Austin to attend St. Edwards University. Sue, as well, we're very pleased you're here with us today. Thirdly, Bob, Bob Janino Racine is the Chief Executive Officer of U Aspire, formerly known as ACCESS, capital A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, a national leader in providing college affordability services to young people and families, whose mission is to ensure that all young people have the financial information and resources necessary to find an affordable path to and through post-secondary education. Since joining U Aspire in 2005, Bob has overseen a dramatic expansion of the Boston-based nonprofit's impact, quadrupling the number of high school seniors served, launching new programming that serves middle, early high school, and college-aged youth, and opening two new locations in Springfield and Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, in the last three years alone, U Aspire was named a social innovator by the Social Innovation Forum, was recognized in 2012 by Opportunity Knox as one of the nation's best nonprofits to work for, received the Committed to Access Award by the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Massachusetts, and was awarded the Boston Foundation's prestigious Out of, Out of the Blue Award, recognizing exceptional nonprofit leadership in Boston. Bob is a graduate of Harvard College. We're very pleased to have you here with us today. And finally, Michael Harris, Professor Harris, who's been on the faculty 
uh, here at SMU at the Simmons School of Education just this uh, past year alongside me. Michael came from the University of Alabama and I won't um, uh, retrace uh, his biography other than to say he is a national a scholar in matters of higher education organization and finance and I'm very pleased Michael that you're uh, here on this panel today as well. I'd like to turn to each of you, our panelists, asking you to speak for just a few minutes about the nature of the problem that we have before us. And I'd like to begin our conversation by turning to Dan Weaver. Uh, Dan, um, you bring to us today a broad policy perspective on the problem of student loan indebtedness. Are there one or two things that you believe this state, the state of Texas, or that other states can and must do to help solve the problem? First, let me offer my thanks for being here, Dean. The Michaels, uh, Commissioner Paredes does send his, he does send his regrets. He's a much more eloquent speaker than I am. I think I look better than he does. But, <laughs> but we can talk about that in further detail later. Uh, actually, I, your last slide, prior to this previous last slide, uh, everybody, all of us bear some responsibility. Uh, usually when everybody bears some responsibility, nobody ultimately takes any responsibility. So we have a lot of opportunities to finger point around the state, around the country. Uh, and it's problematic because there's always somebody else that's going to fix the problem and it's never really residing within your particular institution or your organization. Uh, I, am, I am with the Higher Education Coordinating Board. We are primarily a policy uh, generating entity. We have two main focuses with the current legislative session that we're working on. Uh, some of you may have heard some of this before, and I apologize for repeating some of it. Uh, one of them is outcome-based funding. So historical uh, higher ed is usually funded on enrollment at institutions and not necessarily how students are doing, how they're progressing towards their degree. The coordinating board for the last six years has been working on some portion of the state funding being tied to some outcome measure. In uh, last session, Chairman Branch passed House Bill 9, I believe. House Bill 9, House Bill 10, House Bill 9. They instructed the coordinating board to collaborate with our uh, constituents, primarily institutions, uh, faculty, to come up with certain outcome measures that were reflective of them being successful and then tying a very small portion of the formula funding that they get for higher education to those outcomes. That bill is being, or that implementation is currently being debated at the Capitol. Uh, the Appropriations Committee and the Senate Finance Committee are, they're struggling with the notion of, of we've been doing it one way forever, why would we want to change and are we going to change something that we don't intend to change and have some unintended consequences. There is a substantial momentum around the country for outcome funding. Uh, we used to be leading the charge and now we're kind of in the middle of the pack because other states have been more aggressive at passing those types of bills. Uh, but that's one, that's one issue that's essentially at the top of the coordinating board strategy with this current legislative session that's ongoing. The second piece of which I'm a little bit more familiar with is, is restructuring our financial aid system within the state. Uh, I know some of you are private mm -hmm. institutions, and I actually will hit a little bit on the TEG uh, program, tuition, e tuition equalization grant. Uh, it is tied actually to the FTE funding that gets appropriated to uh, uh, general academic teaching institutions. So as the dollars per FTE continue to erode from a state's perspective, the value of a TEG award at SMU or any of the other private institutions continues to decline. And I think the last figure that you had up was 62.90 per FTE and a TEG award is 50% of that value. So as institution, public institutions get more efficient, there becomes less and less dollars per FTE, the value of that award for private school students continues to erode and then the purchasing power goes down. One of our other main initiatives on financial aid is to try to redistribute the amount of money that goes to incoming freshmen in order to assure that they've got some state support when they enroll for the very first time. Uh, the research that our Policy Institute has been conducting for the last couple of years very strongly supports the notion that a, a incoming freshman is most sensitive to gift aid or grants. The coordinating board or the state policy previously on Texas Grant, which is our largest program, rewarded 
continuation awards or renewal awards for continuing students and as we ran out of money and there were no funds available, we had to ration incoming students and some students got nothing. So the dichotomy was we had population of students progressing that didn't get any state financial aid and the way the statutes were structured, they never could get a Texas grant. So we're in the process of trying to fix, make a fix of that, trying to make some assurances that a incoming freshman, either at a community college or university, has access to some state financial aid program, and then facilitating transfers between community colleges and universities. Uh, that also is not, it's very different than how the program is currently structured. So whenever something is very different, there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of gnashing of teeth of why do I want to change something change something that, that's, that's had some success. I'm gonna stop there if that's all right, or do you that is all right. continue going on? No, thank you, Dan, appreciate that. Um, Dan has indicated some things that are going on at the state level, the level of, of state policy system, that both have implications and, and can well impact both in the short and the long term, um, the college costs, as well as uh, the ability of students to pay for college. Sue, so, uh, under your leadership, uh, Texas Guarantee has witnessed, as I mentioned earlier, this significant decline in the cohort student loan default rate and increases in cure rates, default recoveries, and loan guarantees. How important are those accomplishments as part of the solution to the problem we're discussing, and what else would you recommend uh, needs be done? Well, uh, I, I think that as it relates to cohort default rates, a, this is a measure that the school uh, is, is looked, looked upon at the federal level in order to have access to Title IV aids. And, and Title IV aid includes both grants, federal grants, such as the Pell Grant, and also federal student loans. And I'd like to put that a little bit into context so everybody understands how important the federal aid is to Texas. In Texas, 85% uh, of the financial aid comes from the federal government. Only 6% of the financial aid comes from the state itself. And about 9% comes from the institutions. And so Texas is very heavily dependent on the federal financial aid, whether that be a grant in the way of a Pell Grant, which is the largest uh, grant program, or student loans, and of that 85%, 60% of that comes in the way of federal loans. So you can tell that an institution is extremely dependent on that income stream from the federal government, whether it be loan or grant aid, in order to pay you know, for their campus. And so I, I see some of my uh, colleagues here in the audience who are financial aid administrators, and for those of you who you know, have spent many years trying to get your administration to understand how important the federal aid is to your campus, not just you know, uh, you know, to the financial aid office, it really makes a big difference for the entire campus. Um, there's a couple things that I just wanted to share, share with everybody. Um, you know, persistence really makes a difference. It makes a difference as to whether or not the student defaults on the loan or not. The number one characteristic of a defaulted uh, student borrower is they do not complete their program of study. And if you start looking at persistence starting in the K through 12 arena, only 14% of Texas ninth graders will graduate from, from high school on time will go directly to college, go back for their second year, and then graduate within 150% of their program length. That's the fifth lowest in the nation. That's what we're dealing with here in Texas right now. And again, to put it in perspective, the amount of borrowing that's done, the $1 trillion that was mentioned earlier, seven, about 17% of that $1 trillion comes from Texas borrowers. So that's about $167 billion worth of student loan debt that is just Texas borrowers that we're dealing with. Now with that in mind, only 30% of the students that actually enroll in school in Texas take out federal student loans. Doesn't mean they don't borrow. 
They could buy, borrow a private loan. They could be paying on credit cards. And they could go to school part time. And to put that in, in perspective, um, you know, it used to be that you could, you know, work part time. We talked about tuition costs. And you could, you know, kind of finance your way, you know, through college. And it wasn't, um, you know, that big of a, a deal. Now, if you are a full time, four year public student, you would have to work 55 hours a week at, min at a minimum wage job to pay for two semesters of college. And it's, it's almost impossible. And as a result of that, what you see is about 45% of the students are going on a part-time basis as a full-time basis. And what happens with part-time students often is that they become disengaged for any number of different reasons. They stop out, they drop out, and again, the number one characteristic of a uh, you know, defaulted borrower is someone who does not complete their program of study. And so we have all of those factors swirling around. We have a very diverse population in Texas, which has pros and cons to it. But you know, from a borrowing perspective, um, I think that families and students are really uh, looking at what is the value that I am getting for the cost of you know, the education that I'm getting. And then how am I going to translate that into, you know, future earnings? Um, another thing, and um, someone who's, you know, fairly well known um, and is actually coming out with a new book, which I would highly recommend, called College Unbound, and that's, his name is Jeff Salengo. He is the editor at large for the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education. And he's done quite a bit of studying, um, you know, on this very topic. Um, this book will be coming out in May, and I would recommend it. Um, a point that he makes is that in, in 2001, 23% of the medium income um, was spent on average tuition for a family. If you look at that today, in two, if you look at it in 2010, 37.8%. I mean, that's a pretty big jump. Um, you know, and I think that gets back to that conversation. And it's not when do I go to college anymore, it's will I go to college at all? And also, another point that he made is the median net worth is currently at 1992 levels. And you saw that kind of on some of the charts that were uh, presented. And so there's rising costs and stagnant income. And that's causing families and students to say, you know, is this worth my investment, you know, in dollars? And so I think, you know, it starts, it starts at that very point is, you know, education of, um, you know, students and families about what am I going to get for my money, which is a point that you all made, and then trying to prepare them about making smart college choices. Um, one of the things that TG has been researching is a debt to income ratio. Not to say that any career choice is bad, and I say that as a theater arts major who has never spent a, a you know, uh, single um, moment of my post-graduation uh, time um, working in the theater arts industry. But, um, you know, if you, the more that you can learn up front about, is this college the right match for me, you know? Is this degree plan, what do I want to be? And what do I make? And then how much should I borrow as a result of that? Um, those choices um, you know, need to be made and discussed up front. And I'll stop there. I have you know, other thoughts and Certainly. ideas. But Thank you, Sue, very much. Bob, uh, your organization and ones like yours play this very important role in helping address the problem we're discussing today by partnering with schools and community-based organizations to reach students and their families with information about college going and financial preparedness for college. What precisely are you doing and um, what have you found that works best? Well, <clears throat> first I'd like to say thank you for having me here today um, as well as bringing my weather um, with me because I stepped off the plane this morning and I was ex expecting a rush of warm air and I felt just like I 
it felt when I got on the plane earlier this morning in Boston. So, um, and I also want to say a thank you to uh, to Sue. We're a proud past grantee of uh, TG's philanthropic uh, uh, program, and uh, and so thank you for the work that you do in that uh, realm as well. Um, our work um, uh, is based in nearly 30 years of working one-on-one -on -one with families and students, helping them navigate. Um, an affordable path to college. And in and, 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 uh, Michael's introduction, uh, he spotlighted the fact that our work has grown uh, quite a bit over the last uh, five to seven years, um, while this crisis, frankly, has, uh, has grown at the same time. Um, and so last year alone, we worked with 5,500, or last, this year, we will work with uh, 5,500 12th graders and their families uh, in Massachusetts and in uh, Miami, Florida to help them navigate uh, their paths through college. Um, we exist, frankly, uh, because I believe for a, a seventh explanation, frankly, that, that was not, if, and if I may be so bold as to add a seventh explanation, um, and that is that our nation's high schools aren't equipped today to work with families uh, and help them navigate the path to paying for college. Um, and, I, and I say that on, uh, because of you know, sort of two major um, uh, issues that, that they face, one of which is the ratios, uh, the counselor to student ratios that exist in today's American high schools are, are frankly untenable. Um, they are uh, in some instances, in some states, uh, California, a thousand to one, um, uh, in Massachusetts, 450 to one. Uh, and so, uh, and when you look, frankly, at our most uh, challenged urban rural schools, that's the, they're even greater than the average uh, in terms of uh, the discrepancy. Uh, uh, and so when we think about the fact that young people and families are making their decision about where to go to school, um, they're doing it when they're in the care of our K-12 system. Um, uh, they're doing it in, 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 a, in a time when, frankly, they haven't yet engaged with the higher ed sector uh, all that much. Um, and the choice that they're making is in April, April or May of their senior year, and, uh, and it's based on whether or not there's someone in their life who can help translate that complexity for them. Uh, the complexity of the multiple award letters that exist, the complexity of the, the many forms that they're often required to fill out, the complexity of their personal family situations, whether they may be undocumented uh, or whether they may be independent from their parents, uh, um, a great, great, great deal of complexity that exists in their lives. And, and so that's, that, that, that time that it takes to navigate and help that family and that child navigate through that process is intensive. And so if you have a ratio of, let's just say if you were fortunate enough to be a counselor and only have 400 students that you're working with and maybe 100 and 125 of those are 12th graders, to spend eight to 10 hours with that student alone on financial issues during their senior year not talking about applying for school, not talking about helping with the college essays. We're just talking about eight to 10 hours alone that it takes to effectively counsel a student and a family. You know, those ratios get in the way of that. So that's, that's the, the first thing that we see. The second is something that's becoming, um, that's really rising to the surface today. Some research that was recently done by the College Board's um, National Office of School Counselor, uh, School Counseling uh, uh, and Advising, um, NOSCA, uh, shines a pretty bright light on the underpreparedness of our school counselors and our guidance counselors. And it's great that we're having this conversation, frankly, at a school of education who could play, a, who could be a, a part of playing a role of stemming um, this issue. But if you go around most counselor training programs at higher education institutions nationwide and, and, and you know, inject a little truth serum into those that are leading the programs, you'll find that almost none of them have any coursework on helping those future counselors understand what it's going to take to counsel families about paying for college. Um, and so that's our current pipeline that's being filled with new folks that aren't really being trained. 
And then if you look at the changes in financial aid practices over the last 10 years alone, um, frankly, you could even look just at the last five years, and you see the rapid changes in the very little amount of professional development that's focused on affordability training and preparation, um, you then understand that if your new counselors aren't being well trained and the changes in the marketplace are faster than the current uh, stock of counselors can be kept up to speed, you have this you know, inability for those folks that care the most, that are in the best position to be able to provide that, uh, that advice and support. So quickly, what, are we, what do we do as an organization entirely focused on affordability issues? We work one-on-one -on -one with young people and families. Um, we predominantly in the 12th grade year, although we do quite a bit of work earlier um, with uh, middle and early high school students and their families about getting ready for a, an affordable higher education and with students once they get into college. But the core element of our work is our one-on-one -on -one program with 12th graders where we pick students up either at the end of their 11th grade year as they're about as they're rising seniors or right at the moment that they get back to school in the fall and we start with a pretty intensive overview of the financial aid process and helping them understand what all of the key steps of that process are running from building uh, an affordable list of schools that you're going to apply to because frankly that's often one of the places where uh, students get into trouble is they don't even have an affordable school on their list um, building their list searching for private scholarships helping complete the FAFSA on time and accurately, filling out the College Board's uh, profile if you're going to a school that requires it, um, doing all of the steps that come after the FAFSA's completion, uh, analyzing financial aid award letters, making sure that students know that uh, what each school that they got into is gonna look like, not just for their first year of school, but for what a four-year education based on those initial economics of, of, that, uh, of that first year package might look like if they're lucky for that package to continue and for costs to stay the same, um, which we know is often not the case. Um, help them make borrowing decisions and set up payment plans um, uh, if they choose to enter into a payment plan. And so that, that is the sort of comprehensiveness of the work that we do. We do it in, in as Michael mentioned, in, in strong partnership with school counselors and uh, out of school time organizations so that we're building capacity and that we're a real partner to them. Um, but, uh, but frankly, you know, we would love to see the day that the types of services that we provide are fulfilled by our, our K-12 systems and our community-based organizations um, and not have to have an organization like ours around um, to ensure that that kind of practice takes place. Bob, thanks very much. Uh, I do want to return to a number of those points that you raised in just a few minutes. Let me turn uh, fourth among our panelists here to uh, Professor Michael Harris. Michael, you study colleges and universities as organizations. You study uh, financial aid policy. You study the strategic behavior of our colleges and universities in the marketplace. Uh, we haven't considered uh, yet much around that second explanation, which is, uh, is contributing to the crisis, which is the role of those unaccountable colleges and universities. Um, what are we missing here in terms of what institutions can do or should stop doing relative to this problem we face? Well, thanks, Mike. And, and one thing I would add to, to pick up on Bob's last point there is how many times once you get those kids into a college, the services that the college offers picks up where, where, when you get them there. And I think that's something, um, as colleges, sometimes our counselor rates are not much better. Um, and so really thinking about ways that we can um, expand student services on campuses, I think, picks up uh, that point. You know, I think the, the first thing I think we also have to acknowledge as a research community um, is how little we really understand uh, about broad-based financial reforms, um, financial aid reforms. You know, the, the, the true lack of uh, longitudinal randomized control studies to really look at variations among financial aid programs and various strategies and reforms that are, that are considered by policymakers uh, is really a failure, I think, of those of us in the research community. Um, and so I think the, the more we can improve uh, that research understanding, 
uh, will provide the context for, for, uh, for both policymakers, institutional leaders to really consider and, and understand the ways that um, we're going to work within a finite budget. That, that's clear. The, um, you know, as much as we would all love to stand up here and say there's going to be more governmental funding forthcoming, um, you know, there may be a pig fly past the window first. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we can't consider the various alternatives. And, and one, um, one pushback that I think the research community needs to provide is where we place the burden of proof on these new innovative reforms. And as, as we continue to, to innovate and think about various ways we can strategically use the governmental funding we have available, is really pushing back and thinking, are these changes going to improve access? Are they going to improve affordability? And can we can we have some kind of research basis behind that? And that's both the responsibility of those, those of us within the research community, but also uh, the policy sector. We've got to work together to, to provide that data so that we can make informed decisions and try to avoid, to the extent possible, uh, the Dan's unintended consequences that, that certainly we would want to avoid. You know, the other question, we we've, we've simply have to have better understanding of which programs work best and for which types of students and at what types of institutions that the variation within our higher education system, uh, we don't want the federal government st stepping in with a one-size-fits-all approach. It simply won't work with the diversity that we have within, within the higher education system. And that's the, that's the huge strength of American higher education that a lot of other countries envy about uh, what we've been able to do in the post-secondary sector. So the, to the extent that we can push forward in that way, I think, is important. And, and a, as an example of this, you know, within the last 10 years, there's been a number of programs at four-year institutions that have considered ways for lower income students to provide financial aid packages that uh, guarantee a no loan approach, right? That uh, Access UVA, the Carolina Covenant, a number of schools have, have uh, undergone this approach to, to guarantee to students that uh, if you meet the, the income thresholds and, and maintain your academic um, records when you get there, then you will graduate debt free. And I think this is this has a potential, and because it, as bad as all this is in a lot of ways, and I, I feel like in some sense you know, we're painting this doomsday scenario, I think in some sense the scariest part is the point I think Michael mentioned briefly, that particularly minority students overestimate the price of college. The price of college in and of itself is bad enough, but when we overestimate that, that's doubly bad. And so to the extent that we can push against uh, the messages that students are receiving about uh, the, the simple unattainability of college, there's aid out there. There's, you know, those of you working in financial aid offices are doing yeoman's work putting uh, financial aid out there and, and providing uh, access to students. But I think that's in many ways getting drowned out by the larger media messages uh, about college. And, and right every fall, you, you can almost set your, set your calendar by it. The first story in August is how expensive college is that year and how college will no longer be accessible. And while we have challenges, Lord knows, there, there's a lot of good work going on. And I think to the extent that we can really push in and, and advertise as institutions, you know, think about the way uh, Phoenix and the Apollo Group uses their advertising and the way we use our advertising. And can we send out those institutional messages that we value access here, that part of our brand as an institution is we're going to provide access and attainment for students, that we're going to give you a solid, higher education experience that's also affordable. And I think as institutions, we bear a responsibility in continuing that message and not selling our latest amenity, whether that's a, a student rec center or a, a fancy new athletics program. But as one of the messages we have to send out is that this is a place where you can go to college and you can improve your life both educationally, socially, and economically, and we're not going to bankrupt you in the process. And so I think that's something as institutions that we've got to start to push back against those messages and, and really coming together as, as a community of researchers, of institutions, policymakers, and really putting the story out there, coming up with solutions, having some data behind it, and then communicating to students and their families um, that this is something that's attainable and there's ways we can um, help you make those decisions. And I think that's, that's really a, one of the key points, I think, going forward is, is we've got to communicate better as institutions what's available. Terrific. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, Dan, let me return to you. Sue mentioned uh, quite rightly the contributing problem of too low persistence rates and of too low completion rates. 
in U.S. higher education. And um, the role of that in contributing to the, uh, the college loan crisis that we have, what, what can Texas and other states do with respect to college persistence and college completion? And let me ask it in this particular context. Dan, you mentioned uh, performance accountability movement. It's a movement among the states. And uh, Texas is considering such, a, um, such an initiative in Ohio and uh, Tennessee, the originator of the performance accountability uh, performance funding plan in 1979, uh, was a leader in that. I is it within the framework, Dan, of uh, the state's performance accountability of moving from rewarding resource inputs to resource or, or to outputs of institutions that you think there might be some leverage in trying to help solve the problem? Or where else in state policy could we solve the issue of too low persistence and completion? Well, I think clearly, clearly the funding. Uh the common perception, you know, you follow the money and wherever the money goes, that's where the behavior is. So we feel like, we feel very strongly that if we start tying some of your formula funding to how successful you are and the, the metrics that are part of this outcome are, are wide. So it includes at-risk students, it includes uh, graduating students in STEM fields or shortage areas like nursing. Uh, it includes grad number of graduates, so not just graduation rate. So there are a lot of factors that are tied up in the outcome piece. There's been some discussion about, well, it doesn't need to be 10% of your funding, it needs to be 25% of your funding, or it maybe needs to be 40% of your funding. There's a lot of nervousness, again, about going too far too fast. But ultimately, it's, it kind of gets back down into the classroom, where the culture in the classroom is, it's not, it's not just I'm trying to get you to the census date so that I can get paid. It's so the faculty know that I need to get students through that course that I'm taking, through the, uh, the curriculum that I'm taking, and then to a degree. The Coordinating Board has many other initiatives with regard to uh, requiring students to have a degree plan before their 45th credit hour. Uh, we tried to get it after the, after the 30th credit hour, and the legislature wasn't comfortable with being that aggressive. Too many of our students are perpetual students. They don't have a degree plan. Uh, many of them are on financial aid, and previously you could get a Pell Grant for 18 semesters. So you could be a Pell Grant recipient for nine years. And you could never, you would be at a point of you could make satisfactory academic progress, but you could still be funded through the bulk of your tuition and fee payments through grant programs. So the federal government has restricted that pretty substantially two years ago. Two years ago. So it's 100. It's now seven years, and it's a hundred. I'm sorry. 144 hours. Yeah. Um, lost my train of thought there for a second. Mm. So ultimately, the institutions and there are, the institutions are also coming on a lot of pressure and scrutiny through the political process, through this whole dialogue of of the debt crisis, the notion of students you can't stay in school for six years. The state can't afford for you to be there. You can't afford to be there because all you're doing is accumulating debt and hopefully graduating, but that doesn't always happen. Um, did I touch on a couple yes. points there? Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, Bob, just for a moment, I, I'd like to return to a comment that uh, you made earlier. Um, you mentioned this gaping divide that exists uh, between our secondary and post-secondary education sectors in this country and pointed to the role or the failure of uh, school districts and schools to help students prepare financially for college. Uh, Michael Kirst and others, of course, have been writing for some time about uh, the failure of curricular misalignment between our secondary uh, system and our post-secondary system and the failure of even testing regimes, what states require uh, for students to graduate high school or not, in fact, in many cases, what universities within that given state will allow a student to bring in as a qualifying um, uh, as a qualification for entry into the, into the college or university. So the real problem structurally, if you were to uh, wake up tomorrow morning and find yourself named the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts, um, what of those things, if any, or others, would you emphasize as part of a state policy agenda? Which of these initiatives that you have named or others are ones that you believe are so powerful that if you had the ability, you would want to see them become part of state law or state policy for higher education and for secondary education? I often have those dreams, Michael. <laughs> um, Are they nightmares? Uh, 
uh, and then I yes, and then I wake myself up very quickly. Um, uh, you know, I would I I guess I would like to say that there it, it would be as easy as that there might be one or two simple things. I I do I do uh, also recognize that there's a tremendous amount of interconnectedness that exists between uh, academic preparation supports. Um, uh, both in the K-12 system as well as in the higher ed system that lock in together with kind of the financial piece of, of this puzzle. So, um, you know, I, I do and we witness quite a number of students who, you know, pass our high stakes testing in Massachusetts uh, and then um, when they take um, entrance, course entrance exams uh, do not uh, place into the even the lowest credit bearing level of coursework and as a result are bogged down in remedial education for some time and and that strikes me frankly as a little bit of a win-win because in many cases then those students are spending resources spending time as as Dan said uh, and and often government resources paying for remedial education that is not earning them course credit right so this is one of those places where I would say in, in, in response, in some cases, our system has, is part of what is making kids need six years to finish school because mm -hmm. we've told them when they graduated from high school with a passing grade, uh, satisfactory grade on our, on our, uh, on our testing, um, that you're ready for college. I mean, that, that is in, in essence the, 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 the the, their belief, their personal belief, uh, um, and as a result, then they're bogged down with borrowing and using up federal aid towards, uh, towards frankly, no end. So, um, so I would, I, I think that would be the the sort of on the top of the list for me because it has some real interconnectedness. You know, much better curricular alignment um, and assessment alignment between our K-12 system and our higher ed system. I would say though that um, that this. Um, this chasm that exists that's called the summer between your 12th grade year in high school and your first year of college, which creates in policy and practice um, this true disconnection between two systems that, that, that frankly really need to better interact with one another um, is a place where I would spend an awful lot of time. I, I, I spoke a little bit earlier about the lack of preparedness for high school counselors to advise students on their college choices. I think that's a, a, a big piece that plays out in finances. It sure. plays out academically in terms of career, career choice, career thinking pathways to higher uh, earning wages and what kinds of schools are, um, are better for uh, the 21st century economy. And, and, and I, I see a real um, underdevelopment, lack of lack of development, underdevelopment of of those folks that are in care of students that are making all of these decisions around college, uh, um, uh, with a, a lack of understanding of the, the the differences within the systems that go beyond um, just simple things like uh, public schools and private schools, but literally go down deep into. Um, areas of study and um, return on investment of areas in those study, et cetera. So, so that would be another place that I would spend some time. Thanks very much, Bob. Sue, so, um, what are some other aspects or recommendations that you have for how we can help dig ourselves out of this deep, deep problem? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned remedial education because I think that is a huge problem, you know, uh, as far as borrowing is concerned. Um, lots of students um, come to college unprepared for college level work, end up borrowing money, become disengaged. I've heard some campuses say up to 18 months worth of remedial education, which they get no uh, college uh, course credit for. And then you've got debt and they likely drop out. And so that's a problem. But you know, I would say a couple of things. The financial literacy piece really goes deeper than just advising people at the 12th grade level or once they've gotten to the college campus. It really needs to be embedded in the K-12 system. We deal with so many kids who have, and, and even their parents, who have no basic understanding of financial literacy. They can't balance a checkbook. Um, you know, they live on credit cards. And, you know, it, it really needs to be embedded that 
in the K-12 system, um, you know, that financial literacy thinking, half the kids don't even make it to 12th grade. You know, by the eight, if you haven't, if you haven't got those basic values embedded in them by eighth or ninth grade, you're probably going to lose them. And so, you know, I think more financial literacy in the K through 12 area, um, you know, would certainly help. The other thing as far as the completion piece is I think we, we have to be, we have to be a little bit more creative about getting students out of school quicker and also recognizing that one size doesn't fit all. That college means post-secondary and it could mean a credential, it could mean a certificate, it could mean a two-year degree, it could mean a four-year degree. Um, and so different kids, you know, different strokes for different folks. And I think we need to recognize that you can't just cookie cutter everybody and you have to recognize that while they're in the K through 12 system and you have to have different career, you have different pathways for those individuals to explore and then prepare them accordingly, uh, you know, as, as they complete their high school education. And so that you put them, as I said earlier, match them with a, with a post-secondary experience that is right for that particular individual and also what the workforce demands are, you know, where they plan to live. And we're finding that, you know, more and more students tend to stay closer and closer to home. And some of that is financial and some of that's family values. Uh, the other thing that I would say is um, everybody learns at different paces. And so I think that colleges and universities and to some degree the K through 12 system needs to be a little bit more innovative and creative about how they get kids schools how, how they get kids to complete and um, the traditional you know you have a lecturer that stands up there and lectures in class and you have somebody that comes to class and pays for class I think is you know really going by the wayside people learn at different paces um, and I think sometimes what happens with kids is they get bored getting in the classroom, going in the classroom, and they end up just kind of drifting through college and, and drifting away. And I think we need to recognize that. And so, uh, you know, some of the things we're already starting to do, the early college high school, dual credit types of things will allow for folks to, you know, get some advanced placement um, college course credit out of the way before they get into school, lessening, you know, the burden. Um, you know, various types of experimental learning, um, on-the-job learning, um, if you have employers who are in colleges, and I know this is easier said than done, but, you know, how do you, how do you get credit, you know, for real-life experience, work experience that you have, um, you know, that you bring to the, uh, you know, to the college? Um, also competency-based, you know, training, understanding that some kids learn at a faster pace, some kids learn at a slower pace. Um, should I be in a lecture hall with 500 other kids when I'm here and they're there or vice versa and everybody has a cookie cutter approach to it? So, you know, how can we be creative about those people who move at a faster pace, let them move at a faster pace and complete the coursework and not just have you know, a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. You know, I'm a very big, uh, Dan and I were talking about this earlier, I'm a very, uh, you know, strong supporter of, of work study. And um, if you have students who participate in um, work study programs, it ties them to the campus. Um, they're more likely to graduate. They're more likely to be engaged in the campus. Um, they're more likely to have, you know, flexible work schedules that allow them to be more successful. And um, I think all of those kinds of things, thinking outside the box a little bit, um, you know, we're having a lot more online learning. I think that online learning in itself as the solution, you know, to educate more people is not the way to go. But I do think a blended classroom where you have some online learning and some lectures, um, you know, are, are perhaps, um, you know, the way to go to try and move students along a little bit faster. It's how do you get kids out at the speed, you know, that they, they need to, uh, you know, move along on so that they're not in college for six or seven or eight years, drifting, you know, through the system and accumulating student debt while they're doing that. Sue, so let me uh, present you with your imaginary leadership scenario. If you were to wake up tomorrow morning and find that you could make whatever changes you wish to America's financial aid system, 
whether that's at the federal level, at the state level, or at the institutional level. What would be some things that you would want to see changed? It, it would be much more simple than it is right now. <laughs> it is, it, anybody who works in financial aid knows what I'm talking about. It is so darn confusing. You know, even, even people who know how to fill out the FAFSA, you know, it's, it's very, very confusing. One loan program, one grant program. Do we really need as many grant programs as we have out there? You know, it's, it's just ridiculous the number of grant programs, and some of them are du duplicative. Um, I would say simplify, 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 simplify. Thank you. And there are some important simplification efforts underway today, and I think the empirical evidence is showing that actually those are having some positive effect. Uh, on admissions, uh, on, on uh, individuals from certain groups applying, uh, greater frequency of application as a result of the simplification of some of the forms that used to be very, uh, very complex. Um, let me just, we have just a couple of minutes before we want to go to uh, question and answer and take some questions from our audience today. Bob, if I might begin with you, just a, one or two minutes of uh, final parting thoughts, please. Um, well, I, I think that um, we, we, we do have to look at this as a comprehensive longitudinal approach. And, and I agree with Sue that we need to dig down into the earlier years and start there and build a, a consistent level of supports that start, um, you know, frankly, as early as elementary school, helping families think about savings, uh, which is something we've not really talked about today, but, is, it, but has to be part of the future equation for how young people and families are going to pay for college. So starting with the, the concept of savings, there's been some exciting things going on in, um, in some cities across the country. San Francisco has launched this pilot program um, where every kindergartner gets a, a college savings account. Uh, um, you know, so starting as early as possible and working all the way up through that continuum to ensure that we're hitting all of the key messages that students and families need about making sure that their, uh, their uh, college opportunities can be affordable. The last thing I'll say um, is probably a little controversial, which is I don't know if anybody's had a chance to see some of the commercials that Target has been running, um, where uh, they're very short, very emotional, 60-second um, uh, 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 clips of students opening their acceptance letters. Um, and, um, you know, I, I sort of talk about the, you know, to, to sort of think about how this crisis has happened. If you add a lack of emotion or lack of information around this process and you add emotion, which is, I mean, I just had a, a son get into school and is now a freshman in college himself. Um, I know first, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> Trust me, uh, there were, you know, do as I say, not as I do, right? Uh, or do as I, you know, however, he didn't make quite as many the choices that I wish he had. Um, but uh, um, but uh, a ton of emotion built up in that decision. Kids, this is their first big decision that they're making themselves. When you divide that by the little amount of support that kids have, the, the, the quotient at the end is the crisis that we see ourselves in. And, you know, I worry a lot that all we have our mindset on for kids and what kids have their mindset on and what we're steering them towards is that acceptance letter. And they make up their mind the moment they get their acceptance letters and they don't take into account what it's going to cost. And so they have driven themselves into, um, into a decision that they deeply emotionally want to be their vision of themselves for their future without taking very much uh, into account about how they're gonna pay for that. So, um, so I, I guess you know, I would like us to all be cognizant of that as we do the work that we do, that we really need to start thinking about how we get young people and families to understand that this has to be as much a financial decision as it is an emotional, uh, emotional one. Thank you, thank you. Dan? I'm, my kids just graduated from college, so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy today. Uh, you, you always want to end on a high note, but being here as part of a state uh, entity, we, we have a lot of, of uh, financial constraints within the state, so we can, we can have a lot of great ideas. They all usually require a lot of financial resources. Um, we meet every two years. This is my 
fourth session. It's always exciting because you never know what's going to happen, but you always know that there's going to be somebody else that wants the money that you need to carry out the programs that are important for your constituency. So I would like to be very, very positive, and I think we have some very positive momentum going on in the current session. However, if the economy uh, doesn't quite perform like it's supposed to, the next session, we could be right back to where we were four years ago. So we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of moving parts and they happen every two years in Austin. And I know some of you folks in Dallas, we, we do work hard in Austin every day. <laughs> um, I guess the high note for me is, you know, reach out to your legislator. Uh, they do listen to constituents. Uh, the, the word I've heard, if, if they get five phone calls from constituents on a particular topic, they'll typically take some kind of action on that particular topic. As a state agency person, they typically don't listen to us very much at all. So reach out to your legislators, uh, express your opinions about what's important for you and, and, and the work that you do. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'll end on a high note and think that I think it's gonna be a good outcome for this session for higher education. And uh, hopefully we'll, some of the reforms that are being in, put into place and some of the topics we've covered today will provide some additional momentum so that the return on investment starts being talked about as opposed to the cost of, of higher education. Sue. What was the question again? <laughs> I was so, I was any, so any, enthused by Dan here. Any parting uh, comments or observations for us? Um, you know, I, th I think that it really gets down to, um, from, a, from a college, um, you've got to be able to demonstrate that you have value, that, that your cost, you know, the cost of the institution um, warrants value for the student, and that's the message that you really have to get, get across. Um, I agree with Dan that we're having a much better session, but there's tons of wonderful ideas out there and so much, so little money, and you know, as I said earlier, only 6% of higher education funding in this state you know, for financial aid comes from the state. The rest of it comes from the federal government. You see how well that's worked out so far, mm -hmm. you know, um, given the sequester and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I'd say start early, start talking and educating people as early as possible and make sure you're, you're making good matches, you know, between students. Don't try and force a, you know, square peg into a round hole. You know, make sure that we're uh, recognizing that, you know, we have different needs for different different people and you know we've got to make pathways for all of those and marry them you know with work, workforce development needs wonderful thank you michael you know i would i would add to that uh thinking about the other part of that puzzle is institutional funding how are we using our institutional aid budgets how are we using those strategically uh, what are our institutional objectives how do those fit in with our mission and where we want to be and who we who we say our values are when we go to Austin, when we, when we say what our values are as an institution, do those, are those mirrored in the way we spend our aid budgets? And I suspect a lot of times uh, our spouse values and our, our aid budgets would not necessarily match up as well as, as one would hope. So I think looking at those, those, those monies within the institution that we can, that we can move and prioritize in, in ways that, that demonstrate to both our own students and, and the broader society our values as an institution Thank you, Michael. I know we have uh, eager questioners among our audience, and we have about 15 minutes left. Who has a question for our panel? Maybe especially to mom. If, if a parent had a child today, how much would they have to save yearly to pay for a private school at a public school? What, what would it take to get there? Well, the, cha the challenge with it is that there's no average. There's no average really when we look at schools and there's no average when it comes to a family. Um, you know, we, when we do our work with our younger, our younger families or the families of younger kids that we work with, we, we try to tell them to have about, you know, if they could get to the place where they have about $2,500 per year that they're envisioning saved up before they get there, that that will be a sort of a meaningful help. So if they're if they're looking if they're looking at a 
pathway that includes a community college to then a four-year school, then that number could fluctuate a little bit. Uh, um, if they're, you know, if they have their dream set on a private school, then maybe that number's got to go up a little bit. Uh, if they have their dream set on certain segments of the private school sector, for example, HBCUs that tend to have less financial aid budgets, then that number needs to go up even more. Um, so what we try to do is give them a sense of the, the range based on their plans. Um, but we sort of use that 2,500 a year, so that's 10,000 if you're thinking it's gonna be a four year uh, education, that's sort of where we start with. And, um, and the closer you can get to that, the better, obviously. Thank you for the question. Yes. I had a question in looking at that. How much of that jump is really due to the increased volume of student loan debt that we have now? Because, of course, we are bringing more kids into the fold and we are extending more loans. How much of that huge jump is expected and embraced because we are trying to get more kids into school? And how much of that is really just due to the age of the loans, that it's really defaulted loans that have jumped? I think that chart was, wasn't it borrowing, not... I think that may be Professor Harris's chart. Yeah, it was, it was percentage growth and borrowing. All right, so what, what's your feel for percentage growth in defaulting, which would really be a crisis to me, not the borrowing? Well, um, right now I would say that uh, nationally, um, the default, it used to be that the default rate in Texas was much higher than the national average. What we saw last, last year is we're, we're dead even. Our cohort default rate is 9.1% in Texas, and it's the same nationally, which is very unusual because Texas, because of, yeah, actually we're, we're, we're doing better. Um, but, I, you know, I think that uh, people are borrowing more money, and I, I think that, you know, the, what you see put out is uh, federal loan statistics, the piece that's missing is the private loan or people yeah. who are putting their, um, there are some schools that don't offer federal student loans. And so some of your poorest schools are afraid of losing Pell Grant funding. And so if they lose Pell Grant funding, you know, they're, they're pretty much out of business. So they will not offer loans. They will only offer Pell Grants. So they don't have to worry about the cohort default rate. Um, and make sure that they're serving their students. The problem with that is that these are students who typically cannot qualify for private loans because of their you know, credit histories. And so they end up putting their, their payments on credit cards, you know, 22, 23% credit card. You're missing you know, all of those pieces. You don't have a complete equation. And I think that's one of the things that the uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau is trying to get at is, you know, uh, we know what is happening on the Department of Education side. We don't necessarily know in total what's happening. They're trying to get a handle on private loan borrowing, um, and they're trying to get a handle on, you know, consumer debt just in general. But, you know, I don't think we have the complete picture. Yeah, but, you know, definitely, um, you know, the average, just to let you know, the average unmet need, and um, you know, at a two-year public, here right now, and this is after you know loans and grant aids and all the awards have been applied, you know, is um, uh, about eighty-two hundred dollars a year and about around seven thousand dollars a year for a public four-year. That's the unmet need, you know, that a student has to go out and come up with, you know, after everything has been applied. And what you are seeing is, um, you know, since we're at the SMU campus, I think you guys used to be one of the most expensive. Um, you're seeing with the publics all the fees and so forth that they're adding, you know, kind of a, um, a meld of the two. And publics and privates are becoming about the same amount of money. And I think one of the, I'll say this as a, a you know, private institution uh, graduate, is that one of the best kept secrets out there. And one thing that um, the independent colleges and universities are always struggling with is trying to get the message out to counselors and so forth who are so busy with so many other things, I think that privates typically do a very good job of helping a lot of these 
low-income first-generation students in with grant aid and different kinds of scholarships. And so going to an SMU may actually be cheaper, you know, for a um, you know, first generation low income student than going to a UT campus. But they don't know it because, as Bob was saying, they don't have somebody that can advise and help them maneuver. Uh, you know, if you ask a high school guidance counselor, you know, um, in the very limited amount of time that they have to spend with somebody, you know, where should I go to school? Typically what they're going to come up with is A&M or UT Austin, and they're not going to think about all the other possibilities that actually may do a better job of working with those at-risk students and keep helping them keep their costs down. Thank you. We had one more question just right in front. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, I actually fit that exact um, criteria that you just listed, low income, first generation, college student. And I was actually helped uh, with Upward Bound. Yeah, so I'm an alumna of Upward Bound and I just wonder what your opinion is with these types of programs, uh, Education is Freedom, Upward Bound, providing this information because college counselors, I mean high school counselors are not doing that properly. Right, I think, I think all of these are very good um, very good programs and there's a lot of discussion right now about federal funding being cut for a lot of these programs. Um, I think one of the pro problems that these programs have um, is demonstrated results and um, there's this discussion of accountability all, you know in every sector of higher education and there there needs to be um, you know results that are demonstrated that can be articulated properly on the hill in order to you know, maintain that kind of funding. And I think one of the things about these kinds of programs, whether it be in high school or at the college level, that you often hear from people is, I want to go somewhere with people like me or people who have mentors like me that can help me because it's not enough to get somebody enrolled in, in college if you can't keep them there and they don't feel connected to the community for whatever because there aren't people like them and you know, there's not a unit there that can help them with that, then they're likely to leave and transfer and drop out. And um, I, you know, I think that that's where a lot of these programs you know, really need to shore up some of their results and be able to show actual outcomes and results uh, so they can have the kind of funding uh, that's necessary. Because they are very good programs and they do an excellent job of mentoring folks. Uh, we're moving right down the rows in successive order. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just, I think it's more of a statement than a question. Uh, I deal on the other side, of, on the default side, and I would say that as everyone made a point to kind of educate as they come through high school and graduate and move into college and, and uh, going into the debt and what it's going to be worth, I think on the way out of college, there needs to be a lot more education on how they're going to repay. <laughs> and in what order they're going to repay. Because I think, I try to think back to when I got out of college and your priorities are much different than they should be. Uh, probably, that's probably the best way to put it. Uh, and you end up with this, there's a lot of things that we can do to fix this, obviously. I think we've covered a lot of those. But that trillion dollars that's out there today equates to a lot of people with 9% of that that's going to default. And it just steamrolls into this now your credit's ruined, now you can't get a car, now you can't get a house, and how are you going to then reverse that trend? And I think, I'm not saying that we need it today to cover that, but I think it's something that needs to be covered in some, in some manner. There is exit counseling available for people who have financial aid on the way out. Um, the problem that you have is if someone drops out or stops out, the financial aid office cannot necessarily reach that person to give them the kind of counseling that they need. And so what you're seeing for a lot of agencies like ours um, and others is, uh, you know, once someone has stopped out or dropped out, you know, there is a period of time, for the most part, it, de it depends on the, the type of loan, uh, where they are in grace and you try to get to that person and find out you know, why did you drop out? You know, what can we do to help you? Can you re-enroll? That's going to be the best, the best way for you to be able to be successful. Or if not, um, you know, what, what can we do to try and help you be successful? I will tell you one of the studies that you, you all referred to earlier that was released on Thursday this week, um, you know, from the, uh, 
from the Fed uh, spoke about the number of students who had deferred or forbeared, you know, put their loans in forbearance. That's a good thing if it's a temporary thing, but what people fail to realize is that the interest capitalizes. And so you may have a $4,000 loan that if you keep you know, kicking the can down the road suddenly becomes an $8,000 loan. And this, this complicates this problem of the growing student loan debt. And I don't recall what the numbers were um, you know, off the top of my head, but let's see, 44% uh, 40 per, is what the study said. Um, were not in repayment due to, um, you know, some sort of deferments, deferment or forbearance. And, you know, that's a pretty significant number of people who are kicking the can down the road for any number of different reasons. Thank you, Sue. Bob, did you have a comment? I was, my, my only comment was going to be that I, I would 100% agree that we need to look at both loan entrance counseling services and exit counseling services and think really how we re-engineer both of that. I, my son, as an example again, who borrowed both a Perkins loan and a Stafford loan to help pay for his first year in college, sat down, took the little online course, and, and could not tell me a single thing afterwards about what it meant. And that is, you know, the, that, that's kind of the moment of truth at that point, right? You're, you're, you're signing on to accept those loans. As, as a student, you know, he had the, the fortune of having, you know, me just sort of telling him what it all meant uh, that he was about to go into. But I, I, I think that we've, we've tried to make things a lot more efficient, and in doing so, um, we've actually created a lot more problems as a result of those efficiencies. So. Regrettably, we are coming to the end of our session today, but let me, it strikes me that, um, that we've heard a number of comments and observations this afternoon about the college student loan crisis that often one doesn't hear in these settings. And let me just mention to you four of them, I think uh, particularly important takeaways. One is the importance of the structural impediments uh, at the intersection of our secondary and post-secondary education systems in the U.S., these impediments to college access and to financial, financial preparedness for college. The second is the rise of the value investor in American higher education, and I think it's an open question to what extent a more discriminating consumer of higher education may have uh, in terms of questions of tuition pricing and affordability writ large in our higher education institutions. The third is the need for simplification of the financial aid processes, both federally, uh, uh, but also in the processes at the institutional level. Um, that may in fact serve as deterrence for students um, moving on to higher education. And finally, um, I think particularly interesting, the policy innovations that are underway in many states around this idea of how to fund public higher education, and in particular, how to link funding for higher education to what happens over the course of a student's academic uh, and lived experience as a student in that institution, and how those levers of state policy might well be used to help diminish the crisis we're today facing. These observations, as well as many others, are a byproduct of the very fine panel that we've had here today. And on behalf of Dean Chard, and in conclusion, I simply want to thank you all for your participation today, and hope that you'll join us again for another Sampling Simmons event. Thank you. Thank you.